So I'll set up my stall. I'm not a Romanist, sorry about that. But I am looking into the ontology of the digital, so I'm using Cajun's Wall as a case study. So we'll see how this goes. And thank you for coming along to this presentation. So, virtual archaeology is often simply used to present a site, but can we gain more out of virtual models? Through polycentric positionality, a concept devised by the Dutch philosopher Jost de Mol, I will theoretically explore virtual models as we might do in the future, using Hadrian's Wall as a case study, as mentioned before. Is it practically possible to do polycentric positionality today or ever? Are digital models helping us to understand the real archaeology better from a digital posthumanist perspective? So I'll begin with my brief analysis of frontier theory as I see it today from my sort of digital standpoint. So the Hadrian's Wall research framework, as I can tell, am I standing in the way of the... Does everyone read it behind me? Am I too tall? Yeah. Oh, good. Phew. Okay, so essentially, to summarise the two pages I have on this thing, is that the Hadrian's Wall research framework is really it's a product of its time. It's, it was quite good at uh, being a synthesis of a lot of the previous research and trying to create a framework, but it's very naive in its use of digital technology, uh, which I'll come to uh, in a minute. It's mainly, particularly it tries to focus on view sheds, like num point number three, which I've written down somewhere, is, yeah, key universal priority number three calls for a use of a view shed, uh, which is to be used as an open access source, which as far as I can find out on the internet doesn't exist at the minute. And the previous attempts that have tried, uh, there are some quite funny ones with national trails and things, University of Hampton's other ones. None of them really challenge any theoretical frameworks about the Hadrian's Wall as such. They just give you an idea of what you can see from the wall. And then you've got uh, Track and Trash, of course, Limes. They're all um, improving on this, but again, they're not really um, doing anything uh, to critique the digital ontology of the, uh, of the archaeology. Do you know what ontology is in here? Hopefully, no. sort of the being of being, basically trying to understand the sort of the underlying existence, basically of the structure of life. Essentially, it's it's a bit deep, but like I said, I'll get into it. Uh, but while there is a uh, criticism of the open access model within uh, the recent uh, theoretical Roman archaeology journal, which is good, this is only one facet of digital archaeology. Um, so, as we can see from this video, which I'll show off in a minute, uh, because I've, I'll come back to this slide, basically. Uh, this video has already got 17,000 views. And if you compare this to Trackamp, is it Tra you pronounce Trackamp? Trackamp, the October, the Eastern Symposium happened in ages all. That only got 38 delegates. And if you're going to compare it on a quantitative basis, then the potential viewage of this uh, video is potentially upwards of the 700 million in Europe alone. There are now 4.2 billion users of the internet as of June this year. That's a staggering number that we just can't comprehend. And something like a conference like TAG here, for example, we can't fit 4.2 billion people in here, to be honest. <laughs> However, it is not the quantity of research we want, it's the quality of the research that we want. And this is, this is possible with digital technologies. Um, so, this is where digital posthumanism comes in. So, Yostemar and others have shown that the digital realm is so unique from what we're used to in anything in the real world that we just cannot compare like for like. Hence, the quantitative analysis I've just mentioned before is a bit moot. So, if the digital realm is dominating every aspect of our lives, can the computer-oriented posthumanist approach help us understand, understand long-standing problems within archaeology? In all aspects of archaeology that we use digital technologies, we just haven't simply shown enough for critical understanding of the effects or consequences of the digital realm despite its pervasiveness. Some of this critique that I'm about to give is a little obvious, but it is what it is. So, the digital realm is made up entirely of numbers, and this in itself helps digital technologies disrupt and subvert every aspect of humanity, particularly in the phenomenological perspectives. If within the digital itself, being is reduced to a systematic process and we can control these processes and natural realities are distorted in a positive feedback cycle when placed within the digital realm, which, which I call it the Photoshop effect. You might call it something else. Tabloids use it to good effect, but it's not just the newspapers that do this. Um, technology has started to decontextualize space, but the digital media go further by decontextualizing just about everything. Uh, Space itself is also under theorized within archaeology. Um, this has been pointed out by people like uh, Criado Boado. Uh, but how do we describe this in the real world? So if I take, for example, of a dice, bear with me. So the dice, in order to show a number, you have to use one side. Show more than four numbers, you have to start putting on sides. A dice can only be so small before it can only show up so many numbers. I've seen a D100 dice that's smaller than this. It's quite impressive. However, a digital dice, does not have to do about sides at all. It only needs one side and display the number you want on the side. So space in that way is decontextualized. So in that way, it completely disrupts everything we know about space. So if you want to play with that, 
I'm also there. There we go. That's it, man. So, we're within this. Uh, so, why is it important? Uh, yeah, so the space is completely decontextualized within, the, uh, within a virtual model or digital model. And so, but it's not just, uh, but not the digital model that's based on an archaeological model is not just a copy of that model. It is a unique product because it, the digital model has no actual basis within reality because of the unique nature of the digital world. It is also not just a symbol or a copy of that uh, object, as other philosophers try to argue. Um, with the realization of virtual reality, we now have a spectrum of reality, which, to cut a long story short, becomes visualized as Manson Reality Cube. Don't worry, it's the last cube. Um, so we have three axes of, of um, describing the uh, development of virtual technology, uh, which also um, shows us our consciousness as well. Using the axes of mediation, which is observation from the world on the inside, uh, it's on the, on the screen, but it's all if you pass around. Uh, registration, uh, which is the ability to navigate in the virtual environment, and interaction where no other form of representation is currently possible. So if I pass that around as well. And so these axes describe every possible uh, currently known state of consciousness from unconsciousness to the brain in a jar theory. If you've heard of um, Nick Bostrom and his ideas about the digital um, sort of hyper-realization of being dominated by nothing but computers. So, with the use of technology comes the accusation of technological determinism. This is unfortunately misplaced because the technology is assumed to develop independently of humanity. However, with digital technology, we have to reconsider the digital, how humanity interacts with digital and vice versa, as it now has taken on a life of its own in some cases, especially now that we are developing autonomous robots and artificial intelligence. And even the idea of development is being radicalized in this respect. So, nice. Where on earth has Heidegger got to? There he is. Got him. So I've scribbled all over my notes from last night. I'm very desperately rereading this. So, previous attempts to explain digital technology have come through uh, philosophers like he uh, Heidegger, trying to apply his German terminology of design or their being. Um, unlike uh, Descartes' demon controlling our perceptions um, experiment, uh, design is translated as the human mode of existence. Because man exists, so design is, is characterized by an openness towards the world. De Mol believes, the Dutch philosopher of De Mol, believes that in virtuality there is a specific mode of design with a distinct temporal and spatial mode of being, which is phenomenologically inclined. It exists in a state of possibilities to be rather than a, sim than a simple unilinear state, essentially, a sign conin, if you know the German. Because everything in the virtual is programmable and decontextualized, we effectively become gods within this world. Beings are nothing more than recombinable information. However, because design is inseparable from the world, the digital consciousness exists completely within a digital medium. However, if, if we take this to its logical conclusion, then the digital is not a separate worldview, as De Mol argues, but a subset of our natural reality. However, the inability to properly translate design into English has been a problem unto itself, as many different interpretations are based on the unusual context of Heidegger's usage of design in German. So all the above could be completely void. Is that making sense? Probably not. Yes, maybe. Okay, good. Phew. All right, so if Heidegger's uh, got trouble trying to uh, make sense of digital. What about another alternative? Fortunately, there is one that I encountered a few years ago uh, called um, Helmut Plesner. Now, Helmut Plesner was a uh, German contemporary of Heidegger who was a biologist and a philosopher. He was a very fun guy. Um, but instead of focusing on uh, design, which focuses on the finitude of uh, frontier of time, he focused on the frontier of space. And so he, he uh, characterized humanity from inanimate objects by space uh, through boundaries. So plants, animals, and humans are characterized by what he called a positionality, uh, which constitutes the manner in which they relate to their spatial and temporal environment. Plants have a closed positionality because they have no centralized response system. Animals have an open positionality, as in they can sort of think for themselves, but as far as we know, they are, have no way of thinking beyond their self. Humans have an eccentric positionality, as they are able to understand the dualism of body and mind, which in uh, Plesner, he understands them as two different parts of the same system, rather than being separate, as in the Cartesian dualism. Uh, with this, a living person is a body, is in a body, and is somehow also outside the body at the same time. I've not tried this, don't worry. I've not tried to split myself into three different people at the same time. Well, that would save me so much problem. But anyway, so the latter, of, the latter of which, the being outside of the body, helps us form our shared world of culture, or as it's understood in German, the Mitfeld. Um, however, Plesner, being a contemporary of Heidegger, was not aware of the digital realm as we know it today. So, I'll quickly go on to the critique, um, because this is quite, uh, this might be a bit long. So, aside from the phenomenological issues of uh, what we've characterized in archaeology for the last 20 or 30 years or so, of all the problems that we have with uh, 
exploring from the self is heavily anthropocentric. Um, not allowing for a sliding scale between humans and animals, you have to be one or the other. I would make a remark about Chester Zoo, but uh, that might be a bit too soon. Um, as mentioned above, the model um, takes the eccentric positionality to be the final stage of human development. Now I've turned the page. So basically, Plesner, because we're in the digital realm now, um, Nostomol has taken this model of Plesner's, and it was original free plants, animals, humans, but Ples um, Plesner did not believe that we could go any further than just humans. Whereas digital philosophers like Yoster Moll actually believe that uh, we can use a digital technology to create a whole new positionality whereby we can jump into multiple bodies. Which. So, Dumoll argues that uh, we are just a stage of evolution and we are not finished at all by any means of imagination. So he proposes a traditional polyeccentric positionality, which is only possible with digitally enabled humans. The human is not only able to escape from the body mentally, but be present in multiple places and potentially time zones at the same time. This can be seen every time you are in a virtual environment, seeing the world through an avatar. You cannot experience this world without the use of digital technology. And uh, so we'll go back to the problem. So hopefully that's explained pleasant enough in a nutshell. <laughs> so. There are other problems as well that I will quickly point out before we move on. Uh, so what about uh, the idea of the solipsism um, of this model? Is that you become very self-centered and you do not accept any other form of positionality or any other form of being as correct as it were. You could be in the most extreme scenario, you could be the last human alive and yet operate all the world's technology and from, the world, from looking from the outside in as an alien, you would have no idea it was just you. Could be, they believe that you are just just all this technology, but you're not actually being operated by a human. So it gets a little deep, but I'm trying not to think about it too much. So, but what about humans who are disabled? Are they already living in a polycentric positionality if they are being augmented by digital technologies uh, to help them with, say, uh, Parkinson's disease? There are ways of treating with certain therapies which are just using digital technologies. But if they, then, if they are then switched off from those technologies, they then become altered states back, not within their original position. So it gets very confusing. So this is something that definitely requires more uh, development. Uh, so, and on top of this, well, it's also very ethnocentric. So we must be careful not to assume too much of what we experience in the digital realm onto the cultures of previous civilizations. This can be summarized as the garbage in, garbage out model, or it's quite simply a recurrent brief uh, critique of the uh, best digital practice. So if we wish to reconstruct Hadrian's wall, as we did right now in a virtual model, it becomes a very large study in fragmentation uh, studies, just while John Chapman's not here. Um, our modern day analogues which we construct in the past are only so good if we don't have the exact information about data from topography, geology, soils, fluvial works, and cultural uh, data, to name just a few. So, as Hadrian's Wall was agreed to be an integrated system, how far do we expand the definition of this system? So, basically, there's lots of problems with current digital models, but hopefully, that's going to allow us to see a bit further. So, how does polycentric positionality work on an archaeological site? Yeah, hopefully, it'll work. Right. Good. So this is um, the power of the technology here is that YouTube is able to show off uh, something really cool like this. I don't know if you've seen this video from Angus Wall. No, this was done by English Heritage about a year ago. Um, but you can within this YouTube video, which I think might be pulled soon, uh, do have a look. That you can look around um, various bits of Hadrian's Wall over two minutes in a uh, what I can what I guess a really highly detailed photogrammetric model. I'm not sure, but it keeps switching between various bits. So, uh, to, I'll use this as the background whilst I try and explain my uh, ideas. So, how does polycentric positionality work on an archaeological site? If we use the analogy of the flight simulator or the uh, virtual reality glasses like Google Glass, we can be de-distanced or decontextualized in space from our original position, potentially to a multitude of spaces. For Adrian's wall, we could study the wall as a truly integrated system, creating a model which uses the archaeological data we have and understanding all parts of the wall simultaneously, not just in space, but also in time. A viewpoint could be theoretically established that showed you two different but connected parts of Hadrian's Wall at different periods of their use. However, this is still limited by the Geiger effect. However, we could also take the conclusion that every time you view a virtual realm or part of Hadrian's Wall in a virtual reality, you are experiencing it through an avatar and you are being decontextualized and having a doubling of your eccentricity, as Jostam uh, advocates. This then opens up new avenues of inquiry. You could experience near infinite possibilities of the lived world of the wall, or you could ask, is the act of experiencing a virtual reality landscape of Hadrian's Wall the same if you are shown to be standing in the same location that the VR location told you you were in? With polycentric positionality, this gets a bit interesting. 
you have doubled your being, your eccentric being, um, and each of these modes of being are experiencing something different and are ultimately defined by the difference between the, the digital and the analog. Which one is this? I think this is house dead. There we go. So, so, yes. so the best way to summarize whether the digital is any good for the current phenomenological research or not is to summarize as follows. Is it better to experience the past as a reenactor or for a digital avatar? Both suffer from the modern analog problem of trying to reconstruct the past using a proxy. However, with polyacentric positionality, one can argue that the doubling of the experience gives you a where is it gone? An experience that is not of one an individual from the past, uh, because it is situated within the digital, and this is something that the people in the past would never have had. Uh, no digital model can ever be said to be a true copy of the analog model either. And yet the digital world does have effects that are felt in the analog world. People in flight simulators report being dizzy or even uh, gaining flight sickness after long periods of use. So the effects of the digital are very much real. As the, it's the classic uh, par uh, paradox of the virtual is both apparent but also real at the same time. So the reality cube, which uh, hopefully is still going around, is uh, trying to resolve these problems. Uh, it might resolve these problems by giving us new technologies that are able to overcome these issues. However, the main issue we see with digital technology today in trying to do something like this is whether we could actually cope with technological and psychological leaps in new advances in technology. A simple way of making um, an idea like trying to understand phenomenological digital technology work is maybe to have a set of VR glasses in a flight simulator, and that way you could have a practical application of polycentric positionality, but this falls over for many reasons. Uh, getting the brain to be able to process the fact you're looking for the sight through two pairs of eyes probably won't work because we're only conditioned to have one pair of eyes rather than multiple pairs of eyes. However, if we are able to reduce the human to constituent parts outside the wall, then we may be able to use the computer as an analogy. The screen can show one or more channels. They may be upgraded. If the brain can be replicated in a digital environment, ethical issues for a side, I don't have time for that, then we can theoretically improve the brain and add additional eyes and ears and limbs and mouths and noses and all the like. So much like Hans Moravec has predicted, who is the guy who talked about uh, the idea of sending humans into space, digitally speaking, However, this is all just theoretical speculation for now, and Yostemol agrees, and he argues that we actually live with an irony, that by having technologies that de-distance or decontextualize our senses, we are bound to live with the technologies that take us into the digital. Until we have a new form of technology that, over, that truly overcomes our bodily limits, you become, uh, only then can you become truly immersed in the digital, and then phenomenological approaches may become more representative of what we experience right now, for example. So, in summary, What can a digital post-humanist approach tell us? Plesner uses space rather than time to demarcate human existence, and through this we can assess technological impacts on archaeology. If we reduce the humans to a series of numbers, then it may be possible to understand sites like Hadrian's Wall in a new perspective. Eccentric positionality, when digitally enabled, not only helps to explain the digital media we use on a day-to-day -day basis, but also helps to re-examine uh, research questions. However, the main failure of our use of digital at the minute is that we want it to be something that answers all of our questions. Whereas all the empirical data we create is in the analog, and we only experience it through uh, the medium of our bodies. And digital media becomes an accessory in which to try and um, experience these. A more critical understanding is required of digital ontologies within archaeology, as we are likely to see a large increase in the use and development of digital technology, even, even more so than now, but it's very hard to predict. Uh, so like any other method, we must be able to critically assess their value in creating and interpreting sites, as well as tempering their suitability for overcoming the modern analog problem. It is my belief that polycentric positionality is the best way of doing this. So, here are my references. And once again, shameless plug, please come. It's only in Leeds, it's quite cheap. And uh, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>